Hey, people of faith, Pastor Daniel here for our Sunday sermon on Sunday, March the 24th, 2024. Today is Palm Sunday. So our scripture reading will be from John. Now, the story of Palm Sunday is found in all four of the Gospels, which is actually rare. There are not many stories that are found in all four Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to read from John, which is the has the shortest account of the story, and it comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. The next day, the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks so much for your word. Your word who is Jesus the Christ. Your word who is the Holy Spirit who is with us now. We give you thanks so much for your word that is the sharing of the faith. And we give you thanks so much for your word, Jesus, that is the holy scriptures that we've read before us. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we speak now and as we listen now, that it may all come from your word. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen and amen. I have preached uh, this sermon about ten times now in my life. Not this particular sermon, but about this kind of scripture. Again, this scripture is found four times in the Gospels. Palm Sunday sermons. And Palm Sunday is a, a very special day in the church. It's the, it's the, day, it's the week before Easter, and it's kind of a, a run-through, if you will. You know, a lot of people, businesses, they'll have soft openings before the grand opening. Grand opening is Easter Sunday. Soft opening is Palm Sunday. And what's neat about that, I think... The people here the, at Faith Community Methodist Church, they kind of had that in mind because this time last year on a Palm Sunday, they had their very first worship service celebrating one year church calendar wise because it was the first Sunday in April last year, Palm Sunday was, in which God started this church. This church started with just 20 faithful people who met together in February of last year and said, we're going to find a way to start worshiping and, and we're going to find a way to be faithful to God. Having church, working together to be disciples, learning how to be more like Jesus, and teaching other people about who Jesus is so they may come accept him as Lord and Savior. And we want to be faithful to the Word of God because they felt like where they were before, they, they, were, they weren't quite being faithful to the Word of God. So these 20 people did all they could to make sure that they could they could start worship, and they started on Palm Sunday, the, the soft opening, if you will. Well, if you think about the story of Palm Sunday, it doesn't really sound like a soft opening at all. It sounds like something awesome. It sounds like a huge parade. You've got Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. People are just like a giant parade, throwing their coats down, throwing their palm branches down. They're singing. They're dancing. They're being joyful. They're they're kind of like King David. King David brought the, the Ark of the Covenant in, which is the presence of God, where God is seated. This is where God is in the world. And he brought it into Jerusalem. And as he's bringing it into Jerusalem, King David is, he's the king. He's the one that all the people look at and, and kind of fear, kind of are in awe of. And he is right there in the middle of the people leading the parade as the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant. David is singing and dancing. And it made his wife mad. She was so mad at him. She said, how dare you make yourself look like a fool in front of other people? That same voice, that same word that she spoke, I feel like a lot of us have inside of us, especially within American culture. We're hesitant to dance. We're hesitant to sing. We're hesitant to, to make ourselves look like fools, as she said to King David. But 
he was so excited that God was coming to make his home, to be with him in his home. There's a word for that. John uses it in First John, in John chapter 1, when John says that the word became flesh and made his home with us. That's tabernacle. He is tabernacling with us. So David is all kinds of excited. God's coming to stay with us. He's excited. He's dancing. And he doesn't care, even though he's the, he's the number one in the country. He is leading by example by showing all that he can for the Lord. By just giving God all glory, all honor, all praise, all singing, all dancing, all joy goes to the glory of God. And his wife, and I'm sure there were other leaders too, said, that's not right, but it is right. It is absolutely right to be joyful, celebrate, have a huge parade for Jesus. This sounds like an awesome story. I tell people, I, and I, every, I've preached this in the past, what should come to mind here, if you've seen the movie Aladdin, whether the cartoon version or the Will Smith real person version, whichever one, there is a parade in which uh, the genie brings Prince Ali, he's transformed Aladdin into Prince Ali, make him a prince, into Agrabah so that Prince Ali can ask for the princess's hand. Well, he does so with a giant entourage. Prince Ali comes in riding not on a donkey, but on an elephant. And there's a lot of people around that are singing about Prince Ali and about all that he has and about how strong he is. And it's just huge and elaborate and flowers and peacocks and monkeys and ostriches. It's huge and elaborate. It is massive. And I used to preach, think about that's kind of what it was. And then, and then revival happened. Genuine, heartfelt revival happened at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky in February of last year. And it lasted for 16 days straight. And my dad and I, we went to it. I had, a friend, I had two friends from seminary who went to it and they said, Daniel, you, you just gotta go. So I went and picked up my dad and we went to it and we just happened to go on the very last day and we just happened to get into the building at the very last hour. And you were thinking this constant worship over 20,000 people came to worship there over a 16-day span. This has got to be something awesome. Something surreal has got to be happening. Everyone's going to be speaking in tongues. There's going to be little tongues of fire on everyone's head. The band's going to be the best band in history. It's going to, there's going to be somebody, somebody's going to be levitating. Like we're going to hear uh, people screech because demons are coming out of them. Like this is going to happen. No. It was pretty underwhelming, actually. <laughs> it was less like the parade for Prince Ali and Aladdin and more like a fifth grader parade at an elementary school. It was so simple. There was maybe somebody on piano sometimes, maybe some people on a, a cajun, you know, the drum box sometimes, maybe somebody on the guitar sometimes. There were no flashing lights. There were no fancy singers. These were just people leading in song. And there were hundreds of people in that space singing praises to God, tears in their eyes, nothing but singing praises to God. They'd come up to the altar and they would just confess their sins to God. Every now and then they would stop. Somebody might preach a, a sermon that, that might just happen in 10 minutes, a lot faster than what I'm preaching now because they're just they can't help but get the gospel out. That's all people wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear about Prince Ali and some fancy parade. They didn't want to hear about a fifth grader parade. They just wanted to hear Jesus came, died for your sins. All of your sins, all of your anxiety, your depression, all of that. Cast it on him because he cares for you. He died for you so that you can rise to new life. And there were thousands of people most of whom were Gen Zers, being teenagers and young adults today, who are giving their life to Jesus, confessing their sin, receiving salvation, striving to live for him and singing praises to God. It was underwhelming. There were no demons being cast out. There were no, well, there probably were, but it wasn't, it wasn't the show. There were no, and not everybody was speaking in tongues. Nobody was levitating. 
There was no flashing lights. There was no pipe organ being banged on. There was no drums being banged on. It was just genuinely people who had their hearts that they were turning back to the Lord. I think Palm Sunday, Jesus riding in on the donkey looked a little bit more like that than a great big parade because people genuinely wanted Jesus to be the King, the Messiah, the one who was going to restore the nation state of Israel. Jesus is the King. He is the Messiah, but he did not restore the nation state of Israel. Jesus didn't come in and say, we're going to overthrow Rome now, and Israel's going to be a nation on their own. That's not what happened. And that's not what happened because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. He's the king of all of the universe. It's not just limited to being the king of a nation in this world. He is beyond all rulers, all authorities, all governments. Jesus is king of all. And he came not just for the Israelites, but for all people in the world. That is why he came. So Jesus is coming in on a donkey. Now, John gives us the short version. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about how he foretold the disciples, you're going to go find the donkey in this way, and they go and they find everything exactly as Jesus said, and they bring the donkey to him. John cuts that out. John writes for a purpose. John wants us to know two things, and he tells us this. This is John 20, verse 31. Jesus did all kinds of stuff, but I wrote all this for, two, for this reason, that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, which is Hebrew for the king. Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the Son of God. And John says, through believing, you may have life in his name. This is why John wrote such a short version of Palm Sunday. But there's something interesting. Two things I want us to take away here from our scripture. One, the palm branches. Palm branches aren't actually mentioned a whole lot in scripture. But we find them early on in scripture in Leviticus where Moses is receiving the law, the instructions from the Lord, telling us how to worship the festivals. And as, we, as Moses is hearing how to worship, how to participate in the festivals, what's proper, God tells Moses, on the 10th day of the seventh month, you're going to have celebrate the Day of Atonement, which today our Jewish aunts and uncles celebrate on October 7th. And on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement is a day that you're to sacrifice to the Lord and God is going to, to cover over the sins of the people of Israel and make us one with him. Atonement, at one meant. How did God meant mean for us to be at one with God? Because we've separated ourselves from sin and God wants to reconcile that. God wants us to be one. So the Day of Atonement is the day that happens. And five days after the Day of Atonement begins the Festival of Tabernacles tabernacling, God making his home with us, David bringing in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem with a parade, making a fool of himself, so excited that God is tabernacling, making his home with us. John starts his gospel off saying, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. He moved in to be with us, to tabernacle with us. God is with us, and this causes a great big celebration where we wave palm branches. The festival of tabernacles on the very first day the Lord instructs Moses is to be a time when people get palm branches and they wave them around and it lasts for a week in which we celebrate the festival of tabernacles. God is with us. We also find palm branches at the end of time. John, who wrote this gospel, also wrote Revelation, the very last book in the Bible. And it tells of visions of heaven and what the end of times will look like. And in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, John writes this, And then I saw a number in which no person could count, people of every tribe, every nation, every language, and they held palm branches in their hand. And they sang before the Lamb, before the throne of the Son of God, they sang praises, palm branches symbolizing celebration, victory over death, life 
eternal. God is with us. Peace on earth. Jesus came in riding a donkey, symbolizing a king bringing peace, not riding a stallion, symbolizing we're about to take over this place. Jesus knew that the takeover was already done. It was going to happen. But he came to offer peace to all who would receive him, to all who would accept. And this is why it's so interesting that the only time in the Bible this word occurs is in this story. Matthew, Mark, it doesn't happen in Luke, but in John. Matthew, Mark, and John record this word. The people, the crowd are singing, Hosanna, save us. Give us that peace that you ride on a donkey and tell us that you're bringing an offering to us. Save us. Hosanna only occurs here. In the Psalms and in the Bible, we find Hashan, which is save me. This is save us. God wants us to cry, save me. He wants us to individually believe in Jesus. But we shouldn't stop there. We should pray on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are in need. We should pray, save us. Save our family who, do, who does not know you, Jesus. Bring them to salvation. Save our loved ones. Save our church members. Save our world who does not quite fully know you. Sure, they may say it with their heart, with their minds and, and know it up here. But do they know it in their hearts? Save us, Jesus. Continually save me and save my brothers and sisters to my left and to my right. Save us, Jesus. Jesus teaches us how to pray. And when he does, he does not say, pray then in this way, my God. No, he says, pray in this way. Our Father. Our Father. God is the Father of us all. We sing and shout today, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King. Jesus is the King. Nobody else is above Him. And we sing and we shout, Save us. Save us from our sins. From our doubts, our fears, our anxiety, our depression. Save us from our arrogance, thinking that our way is the right way. Here's what's really surprising. The very same people who on Sunday were shouting, Save us, Jesus, are the same people who on Friday were shouting, Crucify him. Why would they go from saying, You're blessed, you're the king, save us. To now say crucify him? Maybe it's because he didn't save us like we wanted him to save us. We wanted him to save us and restore us to above other people. We're no longer down here as slaves under Roman rule. We're no longer down here. We want to be up here. We want to be our own nation state. We want to be our own people. We want to be in charge. But that's not what salvation is. It's not you being restored to a, a higher place here in this world. No, it is us being lifted up, redeemed of our sins, restored, brought to life, to live better than our former selves in this world, and to be called up to heaven when this world is over or when our time in this world is over. No, they cried, crucify him, because they thought salvation meant one particular thing. They didn't know about the suffering servant that Isaiah writes about. They didn't think that Salvation meant that Jesus must die so that we may live. They didn't think that salvation meant that he must die and rise to new life that we may be forgiven of our sins. They didn't think about what salvation truly was. They had in their mind that it meant I was going from here to there. They didn't know that salvation meant that we were really going from here down humbling ourselves before the Lord, receiving salvation, allowing him to lift us up to a new humble way of life, a new humble way of living. Let us cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. But let us so cling to him 
that we won't be found within a week's time shouting, or maybe within a lifetime shouting, crucify him. I tried following Jesus and it didn't, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Well, don't you know, following Jesus isn't about getting what we want. It's about following and turning our wants and desires into his wants and desires. Today, shout Hosanna, Lord save us, and let us submit our own will to him because he gets all glory, honor, and praise. And he's the one we're throwing the parade for. He's the one we wave the prom, palm branches for. He's the one whom we shall save us. Blessed is the King Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.